three prelude to love three letters notes Eldridge Cleaver had been in prison in California for nearly nine years Beverly Axelrod is a San Francisco lawyer prior to the time the following letters were written Mr. Cleaver had written to Mrs. Axelrod for legal assistance. She had visited him three times before the following exchange of letters took place. And note. Eldridge Cleaver, Folsom Prison, Repressa, California, September 5th, 1965. Dear Beverly Axelrod, for two charged days and restless nights after you left. I loafed in the case of my skull, feeling prematurely embalmed in some magical ethered mist dispensed by the dialectic of our contact. When I left you sitting in that little glass cage, which I must somehow learn to respect because it has a special eternal meaning now. I did not stop or pause, including the door to that glass cage and counting the door of my cell. I passed through twelve assorted gates and doors before collapsing on my narrow bed, staggering under the weight of the day. The doors and gates swung open before me as I advanced upon them. As I charged down on them, as if they were activated by photoelectric cells responding to my approach. I walked swiftly, but I felt myself to be running, stumbling, thrashing and flailing with my arms to clear a passage through dense, tangled vines. I spoke to no one, recognized no one, and I felt that no one could see or recognize me. Wrong. I was accused next day of walking past a couple of henchmen as if they weren't even there. I kept telling them that, in fact, as far as I was concerned, they weren't there, but they refused to believe in their own non-existence or invisibility. On the third day, I arose again from the damned. No, that's going too far. What a transfusion. I don't believe I can stand you in such massive doses. It may prove lethal. I am almost afraid to return to my manuscripts, which themselves seem to cringe from me after talking with you. I know I shall remain immobile, transfixed, until I've gotten this letter off to you. Then. I really have no sense of myself, and I have always suffered under the compliments of others, especially my friends. I panic. I ran for an office in the Folsom Gavel Club recently. One of my boosters poured lavish praise upon me and my qualifications for the job. I squirmed in my seat and felt depressed. Does this mean that I do not have the ego for a compliment? No, it does not. It's hypocritical of me, but whenever someone says something nice about me, it sort of knocks me for a loop. And you? The things you said sent me spinning. But don't stop. Let me suffer and overcome. I feel impelled to express myself to you extravagantly, and words, phrases, Sentences, paragraphs leap in my mind, but I beat them down, refuse to write them, because it all seems so predictable and trite. I feel humiliated by the words you inspire me to write to you. I refuse to write them. What right have you to summon my soul from its slumber? But it's all golden, and I write this from a sense of the sweetness of irony. The better to marvel at the unbelievable sequence 
of chance events which brought us face to face in a little glass cage in the office of the warden of Folsom Prison. You have tossed me a lifetime. If you only knew how I'd been drowning, how I'd considered that I'd gone down for the third time long ago, how I kept thrashing around in the water simply because I still felt the impulse to fight back and the tug of a distant shore, how I sat in a rage that night with the polysyllabic burden of your name pounding in my brain. Beverly Axelrod, Beverly Axelrod. And out of what instinct did I decide to write to you? It was a gamble on an equation constructed in delirium, and it was right. Let me say this. I was 22 when I came to prison, and of course I have changed tremendously over the years. But I had always a strong sense of myself, and in the last few years I felt I was losing my identity. There was a deadness in my body that eluded me, as though I could not exactly locate its sight. I would be aware of this numbness, this feeling of atrophy, and it haunted the back of my mind. Because of this numb spot, I felt peculiarly off balance, the awareness of something missing, of a blank spot, a certain intimation of emptiness. Now I know what it was, and since encountering you, I feel life strength flowing back into that spot. My step, the tread of my stride, which was becoming tentative and uncertain, has begun to recover and take on a new definiteness, a confidence, a boldness, which makes me want to kick over a few tables. I may even swagger a little. And, as I read in a book somewhere, push myself forward like a train. Now turn the record over and play the other side. I have tried to mislead you. I am not humbled at all. I have no humility, and I do not fear you in the least. If I pretend to be shy, if I appear to hesitate, it is only a sham to deceive by playing the humble part. I sucker my fellow men in and seduce them of their trust. And then, if it suits my advantage, I lower the boom mercilessly. I lied when I stated that I had no sense of myself. I am very aware of my style. My vanity is as vast as the scope of a dream. My heart is that of a tyrant. My arm is the arm of the executioner. It is only the failure of my plots that I fear. Whereas in the past we've had prophets of doom, in my vanity I wish to be the voice of doom itself. I am angry at the insurgents of Watts. They have pulled the covers off me and revealed to all what potential may lie behind my Tom smile. I had planned to run for President of the United States. My slogan? Put a black finger on the nuclear trigger. 400 years of docility, of being calm, cool, and collected. Under stress and strain would go to prove that I was the man for the job. That I would not panic in a crisis and push the button. I could be counted on to be cool. It was a cinch. I had it made. But then came Watts. All my plans went up in smoke. And so, with worn out tools, I stooped to begin again. Please take care of yourself. Until something happens, I shall remain because I have no other choice. And even if I had another choice, I would still remain. Most emphatically yours, Eldridge.
Beverly Axelrod, attorney at law, San Francisco, California, September 10th, 1965. Dear Eldridge Cleaver, the need for expression is now upon me, having finished the legal matters, and I'm getting panicky. I'm not strong enough to take the safest course, which would be to not widen the subject matter of our correspondence, and I'm having a terrible time trying to say what I want, knowing it will be read by the censors. Your letter, which I keep rereading, shows you're going through the same turmoil I am, but I bear the onus of having allowed it. You talk about it being lethal, and then about life coming back, and I know that both are true. I'm going purely on instinct now, which is not usual for me, but somehow I know I'm right, or maybe it's just that it's so important that I don't care about the risk of being wrong. Am I coming through to you? I'm writing I know in an obscure kind of way because of the damnable lack of privacy in our communications. Believe this, I accept you. I know you little and I know you much, but whichever way it goes, I accept you. Your manhood comes through in a thousand ways, rare and wonderful. I'm out in the world with an infinity of choices. You don't have to wonder if I'm grasping at something because I have no real measuring stick. I accept you. About that other side of the record, did you really think I didn't know? Another facet of the crystal might be an after term. I have a few facets myself. I do not fear you. I know you will not hurt me. Your hatred is large, but not nearly so vast as you sometimes imagine. It can be used, but it can also be soothed and softened. What an enormous amount of exploring we have to do. I feel as though I'm on the edge of a new world. Memo to me. Be rational. It cannot be resolved. The choices. One, he believes everything he says, but he cannot know he has no choice. Or, two, it's a beautiful put-on because he doesn't know that you would do exactly what you are doing for him anyway. Or, three, it's a game to relieve the monotony, conscious or not. Answer, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference because I can't find out. He can't find out and it's too late anyway. The only important thing is to get him out. And that was obvious from the first letter, with all lawyer-like objectivity. What an awesome thing it is to feel oneself on the verge of the possibility of really knowing another person. Can it ever happen? I'm not sure. I don't know that any two people can really strip themselves that naked in front of each other. We're so filled with fears of rejection and pretenses that we scarcely know whether we're being fraudulent or real ourselves. Of all the dangers we share, probably the greatest comes from our fantasizing about each other. Are we making each other up? We have no way of testing the reality of it. I can't write anymore. I'm thunderstruck at having written this much. I'm afraid to read it over because it's likely I would tear it up. So I'll send it as is. Can you imagine how much I haven't said? Sincerely yours, Beverly Axelrod. Eldridge Cleaver, Folsom Prison, Repressor. California, September 15th, 1965. Dear Beverly Axelrod, your letters to me are living pieces, chunks of you, and are the most important things in my life. 
this is fantastic. It only happens in books or in the dreams of inmates of insane asylums. And with people who are for real. I share with you the awesome feeling of being on the verge of really knowing another person. I place a great deal of emphasis on people really listening to each other. To what the person has to say. Because one seldom encounters a person capable of taking either you or themselves seriously. But I was not really like this when I was out of prison. Although the seeds were there, but there was too much confusion and madness mixed in. I was not too interested in communicating with other people. That is not true. What I mean is, I had a profound desire for communicating with and getting to know other people, but I was incapable of doing so. I didn't know how. Do you know what shameless thought just bullied its way into my consciousness? That I deserve you. That I deserve to know you and to communicate with you. That I deserve to have all this happening. What have I done to merit this? I don't believe in the merit system. I am that I am. No, I will not hurt you. Memo to us. One. He believes everything he says and knows what he is saying. 2. Put-ons are cruel, and how could I be cruel to you? 3. He does not play games, and he does not find life monotonous, conscious or not. He has plans and dreams, and he is deadly serious. Answer. It makes every bit of difference, and I hope to help you find out. He is already finding out. Taking it like you find it is a burn. It sells yourself short. Be discerning and take only after you spot what you like. But I'm hoping that it is too late for you to flip over on me because it is certainly much too late for me. Your thoughts of all the dangers we share Probably the greatest comes from our fantasizing about each other. Are we making each other up? Bothers me. It would be very simple if that were the case. I could arrange and how easy it would be to spend the rest of my life in prison and we could live happily ever after. But it is not that easy, is it? I seek a lasting relationship. Something permanent in a world of change in which all is transitory, ephemeral and full of pain. We humans, we are too frail creatures to handle such titanic emotions and deep magnetic yearnings, strivings and impulses. The reason two people are reluctant to really strip themselves naked in front of each other is because in doing so they make themselves vulnerable and give enormous power over themselves one to the other. How awful, how deadly, how catastrophically they can hurt each other, wreck and ruin each other forever. How often indeed they end by inflicting pain and torment upon each other. Better to maintain shallow, superficial affairs. That way the scars are not too deep. No blood is hacked from the soul. You beautifully, oh how beautifully spoke in your letter of... What an awesome thing it is to feel oneself on the verge of the possibility of really knowing another person. And I feel as though I am on the edge of a new world. Getting to know someone, entering that new world, is an ultimate, irretrievable leap into the unknown. The prospect is terrifying. The stakes are high. The emotions are overwhelming. In human experience, only the perennial themes can move us to such an extent. Death, birth, the grave, love, hate. I do not believe that a beautiful relationship has to always end in carnage. I do not believe that we have to be fraudulent and pretentious. because. That is the source of future difficulties and ultimate failure. 
if we project fraudulent, pretentious images, or if we fantasize each other into distorted caricatures of what we really are, then when we awake from the trance and see beyond the sham in front, all will dissolve. All will die and transform into bitterness and hate. I know that sometimes people fake on each other out of genuine motives to hold on to the object of their tenderest feelings. They see themselves as so inadequate that they feel forced to wear a mask in order to continuously impress the other. I do not want to hold you. I want you to stay out of your own need for me. I seek the profound. Contrary to the advice of the prophet, I'll take the credit and let the cash go. What I feel for you is profound. Beverly... There is something happening between us that is way out of the ordinary. Ours is one for the books, for the poets to draw new inspiration from, one to silence the cynics, and one to humble us by reminding us of how little we know about human beings, about ourselves. I did not know that I had all these feelings inside me. They have never been aroused before. Now they cascade down upon my head and threaten to beat me to the ground, into the dust. But because of the strength of the magnetic pull I feel toward you, I'm not phased and I know that I can stand against the tide. I even respect you behind your back. I have a bad habit when speaking of women, while only men are present, of referring to women as bitches. This bitch this and this bitch that, you know. A while back I was speaking of you to a couple of cutthroats and I said, This bitch, and I felt very ashamed of myself about that. I passed judgment upon myself and suffered spiritually for days afterward. This may seem insignificant, but I attach great importance to it because of the chain of thought kicked off by it. I care about you. I am concerned about you, which is all very new for and a sharp departure from Eldridge X. Your persistent query, how can he tell? He has no choices, deserves an answer, but it is not the type of question that can be answered by words. It takes time and deeds, and this involves trust. It involves making ourselves vulnerable to each other, to strip ourselves naked, to become sitting ducks for each other. And if one of the ducks is shamming, then the sincere duck will pay in pain. But the deceitful duck, I feel, will be the loser. If both ducks are shamming, what a lark, what a fiasco, what a put on, what a despicable thought. I laugh at it because it has no power over me. I do not feel vulnerable to it. I feel protected by the flashing eyes of Portia. I extended my trust to you. I am vulnerable and defenseless, and I make myself a duck for you. Listen, your letter is very beautiful, and you came through with rockets on. You came through and landed on your feet, with the spiked shoes on, right on my heart. It is not that we are making each other up, and it is not ourselves alone who are involved in what is happening to us. It is really a complex movement taking place, of which we are mere parts. We represent historical forces, and it is really these forces that are coalescing and moving toward each other, and it is not a fraud forced out of desperation. We live in a disoriented, deranged social structure, and we have transcended its barriers in our own ways and have stepped psychologically outside its madness and repressions. It is lonely out there. We recognize each other, and having recognized each other, is it any wonder that our souls hold hands and cling together even while our minds equivocate? hesitate, vacillate, and tremble. 
Peace. Don't panic and don't wake up. Dream on. I am yours, Eldridge.